we'll get started momentarily. Um, Jim Mackin, who will, will lead us off. So good evening, uh, I'm Jim Mackin and uh, I'm the local historian, but there's about 15 of us local historians that constitute the Bloomingdale Neighborhood History Group. And we partner uh, with great affection with the Columbus Amsterdam Business Improvement District. And in a loose sense, but it's begun, gonna become more profound with the um, International Hostel Building here. This is a fabulous room before COVID, we were doing a lot of programs here and we're hoping that'll uh, start up again. Uh, so let, let me tell you something about the building, first of all. It has, uh, it, it was built in 1884, same year the Dakota was built. And the architect of it is the only architect in New York City that has a monument to him. And that's Richard Morris Hunt. His monument is on uh, Fifth Avenue um, at about 71st, 70th Street. And he built the base to the Statue of Liberty. He built what was uh, for a while, uh, maybe still be the largest private residence in the United States, or at least in the Eastern United States. And that's the Biltmore down in Asheville, North Carolina. And then he built this thing, which was called the Association for Aged and Indigent Females. As crazy as that sounds, it was simply a, a device to um, help women whose husbands fought in the Revolutionary War, the War of 1812, and any other wars that were involved in at the time, they, they could retire in, in, in this building, which, which they did. And by the 1960s, there were no more of those women, which was a, a good news. So um, th this hostel building is absolutely fabulous. This particular room used to have Tiffany windows if you want to see them, they're down in Florida in the museum there in Winter Haven. Uh, so it's quite a room. They, they added on this part to the building just to have a chapel, but they turned it into kind of a, a ballroom thing. The hostel itself is the largest in the Western Hemisphere, 700 beds here. And if you sit outside, which I've done on occasion, you'll see people from all over the world coming here it, it's a kind of um, reasonably priced alternative to like a high priced midtown hotel. And you'll meet people from other places. And if you stay here, you can use musical instruments, which they use, leave out. There's a lot of um, public art, there, there's food. It, it, it's just a, a fabulous place. So we're here again under the auspices of the Columbus Amsterdam Business Improvement District, which kind of organizes restaurants and, and other commercial ventures in the neighborhood. And there's open streets and a lot of miscellaneous programs. And it kind of, we take it for granted, but they clean up a lot of the street sidewalks, planting trees, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, the Bloomingdale Neighborhood History Group of which I'm one of about 15 members we simply revel in our neighborhood history. And every month we put on programs like this. Again, during COVID, we've been doing it by Zoom, but we're gonna come back and hopefully uh, do some in here. We have a few coming up in the fall. Uh, we have one on, um, what's the one we have in September? Marjorie? Yeah, the Sullivanians. That, that's that uh, funky group from the Upper West Side where everybody kind of shared partners and all sorts of crazy stuff went on. The, 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 the book has become a hot seller recently. Um, and we've got one or two other things planned after that. Uh, we have a website called upperwestsidehistory.org. If you go to the website, you'll see that we do monthly tours of the neighborhood. It's, they're free. Um, We've, we've got a list there of all 1,100 buildings in the neighborhood, and it gives the architect and the, and the year it was built. Um, it's got all sorts of other great material. We do um, uh, exhibits, like in the Bloomingdale branch of the public li New York Public Library on 100th Street. There's an exhibit there now about the library's history, but previously we've had histories of the old African-American community on West 99th Street, the 24th Precinct. And in this room, before COVID again, we did programs on things like the Ninth Avenue L, movies in the neighborhood, all the medical institutions. We had the first women's hospital here, first cancer hospital. I could go on and on and on and on. 
Um, it's just a fabulous neighborhood. It's a fabulous venue. And tonight we have a fabulous talk, um, which you probably would not hear any, any other place. It's very special. And for that, Peter will tell you about uh, uh, Jennifer. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Thank and, um, so um, tonight, Jennifer Maya Luce Pliego will, an artist who has photos put together in a project called Good Neighbors that she's been taking for a number of years. Her she's also done research um, on Annabella Viles, um, a veteran who lost his life in Vietnam and who has a playground named after him on West 108th Street. She's done a, a banner with a portrait of him there and has provided further information about that. Um, she's also the curator for the Taller Latino Americano um, Brady Alexis Gallery, which has rotating exhibits at that playground that started under COVID. And so every three times a year, she changes that exhibit. And um, it's really worthwhile visiting. Um, tonight, as part of her master's graduate work at SUNY Empire State, she'll present a fraction, just a tiny bit of her exploration of the stories behind the opposition to urban renewal and Operation Move-In and um, a, a mom, Charmaine Edmonds, who provided leadership in that movement and helped it develop into what became UHAB and the Urban Homesteaders and uh, whatever, um, sorry. Um, there, this area has a high concentration of these sweat equity buildings and there, they transformed an area that where there had been abandonment and they brought engaged citizen owners into the life of the community. So with no further ado, thank you, Jennifer. Hi. Hi. Um, first, uh, thank you for having me, uh, the Columbus Amsterdam bid, uh, the Bloomingdale History Group, and Hosteling International. I'm really happy to be here, and I'm looking forward to share some of these preliminary findings with you. Um, I want to just start off um, with a land acknowledgement. Um, I'm gonna be talking about this place, this neighborhood that we refer to as the Bloomingdale neighborhood. In my piece, I'm gonna be talking about the Manhattan Valley, um, but this place is the original homelands of the Lenape people. So I just wanted to acknowledge that and invite everybody just to take a little breath and absorb that and find our place in a history that's much larger than we can even imagine. Thank you. Oops. Michael, it's not working. Ah, oh, there it is, okay. Um, Peter mentioned my good portrait, my good neighbor's um, portrait project. Um, here are just a few examples of what I've been doing in the neighborhood of the Manhattan Valley. I've been photographing between 106th and 110th Street, between Amsterdam Avenue and Columbus Avenue primarily. I have over 300 portraits of the residents of this very small bubble. Um, what I like to say about it is, is that It's really a portrait of a place over time and how it's the people that are in that place that make a home feel like a home. Uh, Peter also mentioned the Anibal Aviles playground. Um, here is a picture of the installation that we did. The painting portrait came from his 1962 yearbook picture 
and we contextualizes him in, instead of being, you know, a military person to remember that he was a boy. He was like 19 years old when he was killed in Vietnam. Um, and there's his military picture. You can really see the difference of, of just a few years. Um, here's some pictures of our Grady Alexis gallery as it exists in the playground. We um, create replicas of original artworks of primarily local artists. And so far we've had about nine exhibits. Uh, please go by if you haven't seen them. Uh, Peter also mentioned El Taller Latino Americano. Um, these are some photographs of some of the programs that we've been doing during the open streets on the weekends. Um, El Tire is actually 45 years old this year. Yay. And, thank you. and is an arts and education organization. If you need to study Spanish, please join our summer crash course. <laughs> And on Sunday, on open streets, you can come join us to see Alexandra Castaño trio. Okay. So as Peter mentioned, today's presentation is a part of the prelim preliminary findings that I'm doing to complete my master's in liberal studies at Empire State University. Um, it is based on a literature review that was completed in 2022 and more recent interviews with people familiar with the topic that I'm researching. Even though that I'm talking about the Manhattan Valley and the practice of sweat equity homesteading, the larger context for these studies has been the exploration of place. First, our physical bodies and our physical world, like cities and neighborhoods, and then more abstract places like songs, works of art, and even the act of creativity. I am interested in the way that places condition and inspire us and the ways we make meaning of our lives through our relationships and our activities that occur because of and within places and the layers that coexist. Some people are places too. These people are forces of nature who are committed to what they believe who ask us to dream with them, who promote change, inspire us, and present new ways of engaging, and, co and who can encourage others to find the strength in a collective vision. Cheryl Edmonds is one of those people, and she has not received enough recognition for her part in the housing struggles of the 1970s. The story I'm researching and sharing today is about her story. And her story is one that is embedded in the fight for decent housing and also includes how she was an important force in the creation of the 1300 buildings that you have sites as operating housing development fund corporations, HDFCs, the limited liability designation for sweat equity groups that did all the work, demolition, and most of the renovation work themselves, and tenant organized buildings, buildings that were taken from absentee landlords, and turned into co-ops and gave low-income people a chance to be property owners and shareholders. Cheryl's resume of experience here comes from the Urban Homesteading Assistance Board 1974 annual report. Uh, the part that I want to direct your attention to, it says she was the co-director of Operation Move-In, OMI, from 1970 to 1972. It was a 1,000 member squatter group in the West Side Urban Renewal Area organizations took over, repaired, and maintained 40 buildings. Operation Move-In sponsored daycare centers, a free clinic, a food cooperative, a clothing exchange, an alternate high school, a community cafe, bilingual tutoring programs, welfare rights, and legal rights. OMI disbanded after tenants won legal rights to remain. She was the co-founder of 948 Columbus Avenue Sweat Equity Project, which was six units, begun in 1973, and completed in June 1976. She participated in design, physical construction, and management. And then she became a guest lecturer in a number of 
different places, Bronx Community College, Columbia University Forums, MIT, and of course the Cathedral of St. John the Divine. But who was Cheryl Edmonds and how did she help homesteading emerge? Um, uh, a woman by the name of Carmen Nieves, who was Cheryl's assistant for several years at UHAB, she shared the kind of person that Cheryl was. She was a fighter and she knew she was. She would fight to the end if you had a problem or something. She, Cheryl was half Native American, Seneca in some texts, Iroquois in others. She was a songwriter, a music manager, an artist, a dancer, a mother to two sons while she lived in New York City. She sold at least two of her songs. Here's Ashes to the Wind. It's just a small clip of it so you can hear her music. Um, performed by Manfred Mann's Earthbound in 1972. Gonna build us a fire It's gonna light up the sea Burn all the bridges down Set the people free Burn the poison I just wanted to include that because I thought that the words were really apt for our discussion today. Gonna build us a fire. Okay. Okay. So the West Side Renewal Area is a big character in our story. Um, in brief, the mid to late 1950s brought a tide of political and economic investment in urban renewal. As a measure to lure upper and middle class communities back to the city, it was seen as a way to increase tax rolls and commerce after an earlier tide pulled them away to the suburbs by creating incentives to home ownership. Urban renewal efforts caused the displacement of working poor families. 18 blocks of slums were taken through eminent domain in the area that spanned West 60th through West 66th Street and 8th Avenue through 10th Avenue. Demolitions for its centerpiece, Lincoln Center, began in 1955 under Robert Moses. This West Side Urban Renewal Area, which I will now from henceforth call Lucera, <laughs> expanded to include West 87th to West 97th Street, Central Park to Columbus Avenue in 1963. The city promised to provide housing within the new renewal area to those displaced from Lincoln Center's construction. 7,000 families and 800 businesses in Lincoln Center were evicted. The plan was promoted as a way to minimize the trauma of relocation by maintaining proximity to previous neighborhoods and neighbors. However, this housing would not be delivered. Instead, in 1959, the plan facilitated by New York City's Mayor Robert Wagner Jr. proposed 7,800 new housing units with only 13% for low-income families and no alternative for the displacement it would cause. Patricia Kravitz, a filmmaker, was making a documentary about Mark Edmonds, Cheryl Older's oldest son. He was an important cultural figure as the founder of the Soul Artists, a group of young graffiti artists in the mid to late 1970s. Patricia spent some time with Cheryl and learned some about their life at this time. So Cheryl, what she explained to me is that they were living where they were living, where now Lincoln Center is, and they were evicted and people were offered housing in the Bronx. And she ended up in one of those old hotels on Broadway. And it wasn't the best because all kinds of people were there. 
and she was raising two young sons. She goes on to say, for her, it was like, I live in this community, what Lincoln Center was, and I was getting kicked out and they're putting people in the worst possible places. It's not like we've been offered a place to live. They're kicking us out and you're on your own. She chooses to stay in the city. It's like a welfare hotel, really. She was like, we're stuck. It's social class, we can never move up. The minute you make a little more money, you have to pay more money. She was never going to get out. She's somebody that's not sitting still. She wanted to advocate for people, but also herself. So there was something about moving to do it. I think it's like she's looking at the world, not only through politics in New York, but also racial, social, the bigger picture. But for her, it's all about let's organize, organize, and not just talk, but actively do it. I'll be brief here to give just some information about Operation Move-In. The best resource for this movement is from Rose Muzio's excellent book, Radical Imagination, Radical Humanity, Puerto Rican Political Activism in New York, which was published in 2017, who I believe was also a speaker in the Bloomingdale History Group. She discusses in detail the collaboration between Operation Move-In and El Comité to create a refuge for displaced people an entire autonomous community that was working together to right many of the social wrongs that were very real for so many. Here's a little bit of background. As the mid 1960s approached, industrial work in New York City decreased and the options for work were with lower paid service employment, making rents hard to meet. Worsening conditions was the trend throughout working class and low income neighborhoods where zoning changes allowed 20th century single homes to be converted into apartments and later subdivided into smaller and smaller units to accommodate increased populate population density of moderate and low income people. These single family homes and turn of the century tenements would be considered the substandard housing that was linked to neighborhood decline, what they called urban blight. The places where landlords couldn't or didn't care to make expensive city mandated repairs. Landlords delayed repairs in order to manipulate vacancies or landlords just walked away due to tenant demands and tax arrears. Buildings facing at least three years of tax arrears would be taken by the city of, under INREN, which gave courts the ability to adjudicate, claim the buildings and place the buildings into the system of city-owned properties. In short, the city sealed and warehoused, demolished city-owned abandoned buildings for the purposes of urban renewal, as was mandated by federal funds under the 1937 and 1949 Housing Acts that would only allow demolition and then new construction because quote, every American deserves a home and a suitable living environment. Even though community groups were actively bargaining for the permission to renovate salvage salvageable buildings. This is what the Busura looks like, looked like, blocks and blocks of sealed buildings. Buildings were warehoused for undetermined amounts of time in wait for auction or raising. In 1970, a little boy named Jimmy Santos, who was about 15, died from carbon monoxide poisoning in his apartment on West 106th Street. The community doesn't only blame the landlady, they also blame the city because this fam family had been denied better housing repeatedly. The funeral procession turns into a moving procession. Local anti-poverty and tenant advocate groups helped several dozen families break into nine sealed buildings designated for demolition on and around Columbus Avenue and the West 80s in the Wusura. Operation Move-In and El Comité were born as active and group, activist groups advocating for housing, employment, childcare, health, bilingual education, and other community needs. Squatting seemed like a natural result for the fight against urban renewal's focus on property value versus use value or human value, 
as well as the lack of attention around basic human needs. Um, I'm gonna show you a little clip from a video of the documentary called Break and Enter, um, which just will give you an idea about how Operation Move In began. It will begin with the funeral of Jimmy Santos. You'll see the people walking with the hurts. Then you'll see um, that procession turn into a moving procession. And then a little clip about how they started to rip the ceiling off of the buildings to move in those nine families. See what happened to that kid now, don't you? The one that died. There's gonna be a lot more like that if they don't get a lot of people out of these houses. We went to Jimmy's house. We took the furniture. Uh, we moved the family into one of the buildings that the city has closed. And that's when we start squatting. I'm a Puerto Rican, proud as I can be. I'm a Puerto Rican, proud as I can be. I'm not asking favors, I'm taking what belongs to me. Right on. I'm not asking favor, I'm taking what belongs to me. I will wait no longer, I will wait no more. I will wait no longer, and I won't fight another man A little piece of paper, promise me liberty. A little piece of paper, promise me liberty. Now what the hell does that paper really mean to me? Not a goddamn now, thing. Now what the hell does that paper really mean to me? computer. <laughs> okay. Um, this next clip is also from this documentary, Break and Enter. Um, and it just chose this clip because A, it illustrates the instability of the environment as much as people were working so hard to create something that was safe and that was community centered, right? The police were raiding. Um, they had to defend what they had built. And we're gonna see also um, the presence of Cheryl Edmonds in this clip. I mean, there she is right there. <laughs> so here it is. A man over here breaking up 624. The building was in very good shape. So we cut the meeting short and ran over to see what could be done to stop them from destroying the building. We were standing in the street. Some glass came down on some of the people that were standing there. We went up there. And we have pictures of the housing, two housing authority men who were there with them smashing the apartment. You would think that we were in Alabama because they've been putting dogs in apartments. They were smashing them so that we could, so that the poor people could not use them.
They used 300 TPF to arrest 35 of us. That's your old book. It was worth it from the people from the community. Actually, they came out. And I heard Operation Woman is in there, but Comité is in there. Let's go fight for them because we're, those are the people that are fighting for the community. They're fighting for us. We're still holding 38 buildings, and we are not paying rent. Señor inversionista, tenga usted cuidado, en vez de su ganancia, tendrá algo quemado. Señor capitalista, tenga usted cuidado, no tenga que cruzar el mar anado. Uy, el pueblo borinqueño está pronto a despertar en la víspera del pueblo que ya mismo va a quitar. A quitar. The song says, Mr. Investor, be careful. Instead of having profit, you'll have something burnt. Men will be breaking up 624. Okay. So I, I don't know if you were able to hear some of what they were talking about in those films, but I just wanted to highlight that um, there was footage of all of the broken porcelain because the police would go in with um, and, and just destroy all of the porcelain, the the sinks, the toilets, so that people couldn't move back in. And then they would bring dogs in so that people couldn't go back in. And, you know, just remember that these were people, these were families. These weren't like drug dealers or vandals. They were family. They just wanted a better life. Um, so at the end of the clip, they also say that um, at that point in 1970, when that film was being made, um, there were about 150 families and they had taken about 38 buildings at that point. Um, this slide is um, kind of, a, it, it's a book and a newspaper article that's really talking about Michael Edmonds. Michael Edmonds was Char Cheryl's young, youngest son. And the book is named after the way the book is Rooftops and Alleys, um, Adventures with a City Kid. It's named after the way that Michael would jump over the rooftops that he played on and in the alleyways between the buildings where he went to like go and find things and play. Um, it's actually a very funny book because Michael was a really funny and imaginative kid. Um, but in this, I want to talk about how um, the book reveals a little bit more about their lived experience in the West Side Urban Renewal Area as squatters. Um, Michael has lived in New York City all of his life, but he has moved eight times to different apartments. For his first seven years, he lived in a hotel on West 103rd Street. Once, when he was playing in the staircase of that building, he saw a man bleeding to death after being stabbed. So his parents looked for a nicer place to live, but they didn't have much money and most apartments were too expensive. Sound familiar? Then about two years ago, Michael's mother joined something called the squatter movement. Um, in an article that's called for an, 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 for an imaginative adventurer 11, New York is still fun city. Um, the writer, Michael Kaufman, gives us a scene. And the scene begins in the abandoned building next door where he and his older brother have created a boxing room and a clubhouse. So from the clubhouse that's next door, Michael is looking into the street and seeing what's about to happen in his apartment. He looked out the window and saw three men approaching his building at 636 Columbus Avenue. 
It's the junkies, he said, and darted off. The front door of the vacant apartment has been barricaded with tin, and the only way out is through a window. Out of the fire escape and into Michael's apartment, the only one that is occupied in the building. The Edmonds family is the last of a group of 215 squatters that took over a group of buildings slated for demolition. They have been there since August 1970. This article was written in December 3rd, 1971. Once inside his own fifth floor apartment, he raced down the long hallway, grabbed a jacket, and got to the third floor landing, just as the suspected addicts had entered the vestibule. There he stopped, and in a loud voice began talking to no one. Honestly, officer, I was just looking around for some old wood. No, there's no one with me. Okay, officer, I won't come back. Then he raced down. As he passed the three men, he said, watch it, there's a cop up there. They turned and left. Five minutes later, Michael returned to his apartment. That usually works, he said. Around the same time that Operation Move-In began liberating buildings in the Wusura across the street from the Cathedral of St. John the Divine, buildings owned by the Episcopal Church were slated for demolition, which would have left hundreds of families displaced. Also, Marie Runyon, a leader in Morningside Heights, was fighting against Columbia University's threat to expand its campus and evict hundreds of families. Her efforts are folded into the work of many other organizations, including the Metropolitan Council on Housing, and the youth-led political groups represented by the Black Panthers, the Young Lords, and I Wore Kuen, and also engaged students. In response to all the threats of eviction and the deplorable housing conditions suffered by so many, around 1,500 people met at Woolman Auditorium at Columbia University to send a pointed message to city officials, including Mayor Lindsay, in a housing crimes trial on December 6, 1970. Jane Benedict from the Metropolitan Council on Housing presided over the event. And many tenants spoke about their living conditions. From the New Yorker magazine, Talk of the Town, January 9, 1971. One woman spoke of staying awake all night to keep rats out of the bed in which her two sons slept. Another said that her young daughter had suffered brain damage from eating flaking paint. Still another testified that her landlord had threatened another female tenant with a gun and had brought in two men to beat up a young male tenant. At the end, Jane Benedict declared, all rental housing in the city should pass into public ownership under tenant control. The press coverage was so great that the church conceded and allowed the approximately 400 families who were threatened by eviction to remain. There's um, a full page of the Columbia Spectator that's talking about the 380 squatters who were about to be evicted at Columbia University. Also around this time, because the housing situation nationally was so poor, a lot of politicians were looking and policymakers were, were looking into alternatives. In the academic world, a book edited by John F.C. Turner and Robert Fitcher, Freedom to Build, Dweller Control of the Housing Process, argued for more dweller control and national policies on housing Um, which was, oh, I'm sorry, oh, which was based on data from projects in Asia, Latin America, and the U.S., including squatter communities. Quote, as dwellers lose control over their living environments, shelter becomes a commodity of reduced value to the individual and often an inordinate expense to society. As such, he saw housing as a verb. Doing housing brought with it economic sense. It can, quote, provide dwellings worth more than two times more than built by a contractor. And it made psycho-emotional sense, quote, pride in achievement, competence, satisfaction from action, and psychological well-being decreased poverty. 
For Turner, dweller control also meant autonomy. He wrote, autonomy entails the ability to enter into reciprocal relationships. Autonomy means the power to bargain, the power to get what one needs, the capacity to pay in one way or another for what one gets. In sum, it is synonymous with substantial freedom of action. And this is what the squatters had been doing and advocating for, the right to control and design their lives with their own means and with the means they had. One squatter involved in Operation Move-In said, quote, instead of paying rent to a slumlord, you invest that money in your apartment. You do your own thing because it's yours. The persistent and collective strength of community advocacy had begun to find more influential partners that helped pressure the city. Mayor Lindsay hired a housing lawyer, Robert Schur, to create and lead a, an office called the Office of Special Improvement, OSI, within the Housing and Development Administration to deal with the problem of the growing in REM housing stock. Schur and his intern, Philip St. George, were both familiar with and had interest in John Turner's concepts. Schur put together a small program and offered technical assistance and below market rate loans to a prospective sweat equity project. It was sold to suspicious city officials as an opportunity to escape from the overwhelming in-rem housing supply. Jorge Palomo met Cheryl in 1977 when she hired him to work on sweat equity projects throughout New York City at UHAP. Cheryl was a mentor to Jorge. He shared what he remembered about Cheryl getting what she hoped would be a stable home for her family. They started evicting them. She showed me the news, the daily news, where they put her in jail twice because they squatted and they didn't want to leave. They wanted to develop, move everybody from those neighborhoods without any plan, without any relocation, nothing. She fought hard. Then, in order to calm her, finally, HPD gave her that building. 948 Columbus Avenue. 948 Columbus Avenue is where Schur and St. George applied that funding in 1973 with a small group led by Cheryl Edmonds. It's my speculation that Cheryl and Philip would have met in the Wusura. Brian Goldstein writes in his book, The Roots of Urban Renaissance. St. George encouraged the Operation Move-In Squatters to become the program's demonstration project. This time is exactly what, it, what something that I would like to learn more about, how much influence they had on each other's ideas about sweat equity, a term that Goldstein reports St. George claimed partial responsibility for inventing. At 948, the storefront became a hub for different creative groups. Mark Edmonds, Cheryl's older son, created the Soul Artists, many of whom have gone on to become internationally recognized, like Futura 2000 and Lady Pink. The Soul Artists also hosted waste, like, weekly meetings like art salons with artists and writers. Among the, entees, uh, among the attendees were Basquiat and Keith Haring, just to name drop two. Another recollection from Jorge, well, the storefront was first used for Mark. Mark got a contract to paint signs with Futura and some of the other kids. And the day they painted signs, like commercial signs. So they painted signs in the morning. At night, they would have their meetings with the soul artists, and then they would go and paint the trains. In the 80s, we found this Bolivian group playing music in the street for money because they came to play at Carnegie Hall. But the guy who brought them didn't pay them and disappeared. So they didn't have money to go back. There were five of them, and they were living with a student at Columbia University, all of them in one apartment. Grupo Armada, they were very famous. So Cheryl got involved, like she always did, and immediately moved all of them into that storefront, and they lived there for almost two years. Cheryl had another group called Corn, Circle of the Red Nations. It was a nonprofit to help Native Americans and Indians from any part of the world to make it in New York. The Cathedral of St. John the Divine donated office space on its campus for the, for the first headquarters of UHAB. On his early experience at UHAB, Jorge shared, 
Cheryl was working for UHAB. UHAB was already two years old and she was the director of the sweat equity program. UHAB was developing TIL, the interim lease program. That was different than the sweat equity program, the homesteading. We took abandoned buildings, totally abandoned and did full renovations. TIL buildings was more like people living in semi-abandoned buildings. They would get organized with the, and with the help of the city, they would start running the building. Shara was director for the other part, sweat equity. And immediately she offered me a job. She had a position for CETA, Comprehensive Employment and Training Act Workers. I started working at UHAP. I wrote a book, Vamos a Demoler para Construir Algo Lo Mejor. It is in the Library of Congress. I did it all in Spanish. I did all the drawings showing how to remove windows, how to change beams. She taught me. It's like a manual. That was one of the first things that I did at UHAB. And then we started renovating buildings. There were about 12,000 abandoned buildings in limbo, semi-occupied, totally uh, empty, with some people, with squatters, with drug dealers. And that was how UHAB was created, to save the Manhattan Valley, mostly, the backyard of the Cathedral of St. John the Divine. It wasn't a project for all New York like it later happened. At the beginning, beginning, it was concentrated on the Manhattan Valley. To meet the demand of interest for these alternative solutions, the federal government passed some special policies. The Housing and Community Develop Act of 1974 was passed. It recognized the problem that advocates had spent over a decade protesting. The problem of inadequate investment in housing and other social services on a national level and how that had exacerbated to grow the slums and blight in those communities. It authorized the transfer of federally owned one to four unit properties for rehabilitation and gave local urban housing associations discretion to oversee who got the buildings. The Department of Housing and Urban Development created an official process for sweat equity programs that offered community development block grants, which promised broad funding and low interest loans to local authorities for low and moderate income community development. In 1977, under President Carter, who was impressed by the way homesteading reflected his own ethos on neighborhood strength and volunteerism, gave sweat equity more fiscal support. Carter directed Comprehensive Employment and Training Act funds to sweat equity projects, thereby expanding and promoting education for youth and the unemployed. To aid that further, the Davis-Bacon requirement for union labor was waived to get trainees on the ground and working. Yeah, she knew the system. I think she really saw through it. That's Patricia Kravitz. Ed Moses worked at UHAB from 1979 through the mid 80s and saw the evolution of sweat equity programs. He said, she ran the sweat equity department at UHAB. She ran the sweat equity really well. And she's the one who came up with the piece called sweat contractor sweat. What it meant was, is that the sweat equitors would go in and do all the demolition. And then they would contract contractors and do major systems. And then sweat equitors would come back in and do all the finishing work. So it saved a lot of time and it put in professionals, contractors to do the major stuff, electrical, plumbing, all those systems. As a matter of fact, you have got a contract from HUD to do the sweat contractor sweat program. So Cheryl came up with that idea. Well, I have a typo in there. Um, came up with that idea at first the sweat equitors used to do all that stuff, referring to the demo and the rehab of a building. And that just helped the whole program blossom. That was when the Amsterdam Avenue HDFCs got kicked off. And when they finished it, Ed Koch came and did a whole big thing for us. But that was all Cheryl. UHAB and Cheryl, as it initiated, kicked off the sweat equity program for HUD. So it became a national program. Homesteading became widely seen as a way to restore the fabric of local communities, being a means to foster 
neighborhood stabilization, a way to recycle housing stock, and to bring those buildings back into the city's tax base. A quote from Howard Birchman from his white paper on homesteading for the federal government states, the example of homesteading is one that turned a waste product into a valuable resource. Um, Um, one more quote from a text. Um, in, in unlocking progressive corporate governance, the black and brown HDFC key, Gregory Lewis writes, most tenants brought share, most tenants who bought shares in HDFCs invested in worthless abandoned buildings. They did this to secure a place in a community by attaining a status to which the law accords real power, that of a property owner. So um, thank you for giving me time. Oh, I wanna show you um, in the margin there in this larger picture is Ed Koch, <laughs> who was the mayor at the time. And there's Cheryl. And that is an apartment in the building that um, that group of people homesteaded on Amsterdam Avenue. They homesteaded five buildings all at the same time. Um, so thank you all for giving me time to tell Cheryl's, a little piece of Cheryl's story. Um, Jorge Palumbo is my brother-in-law. I have raised my son in the apartment that he built nearly 50 years ago. I've been familiar with his story and therefore tangentially Cheryl's story for many years. She was a person with a very significant lived experience, a woman with Native American roots and ties to her community. She and her family had been affected directly by poorly conceived policies. She was raising two children in difficult circumstances. And despite all the instability and what must have been so much pressure and stress, she had the strength, the vision, and the fortitude to be a leader, to face arrest, to learn construction, to connect within and outside her community to find support for her cause and to foster new and imaginative ways to use resources. If anything, I hope I made the argument that her story has value and is worth saving. Uh, one last recollection before I open to questions um, by Jorge Palumbo. I told you the one with the angels, the hell's angels. We had some Puerto Rican group of mostly single women many older women too, in the, old, in the Lower East Side. I don't remember exactly what street, but it was Avenue C or D. A famous bar is on the corner where these motorcycle guys used to come every Friday. And then the buildings were next door. So one day Cheryl developed the idea because we knew that those groups would not be able, I mean, most, almost not one man, you know? It's not this woman couldn't do it, but it was, a five-story building like this. He goes like this to me. <laughs> and you have to demo. So one Friday night, she told me, let's go. And I went with her. And she went to the bar. She was almost half of the size of these monsters. Me too. And she asked for the boss. And so this one big guy with a mustache and a beard comes out. And basically, she tells him, if you help this work here, because you have a lot of power and strength, you know, in the weekend, you can help these Puerto Rican old ladies to demolish that building, the interior. I can trade an empty lot so you can park your motorcycles because they had parked their motorcycles around all around the street. Well, the project happened. Those guys came on weekends, you know, and helped do the demolition. I remembered the abuelitas because they cooked and these guys helped and the project kept going. It was incredible. But that was the type of thing that she used to do. She connects resources from wherever she could, you know, in order to make decent housing for people. Thank you. If I can answer, I'm happy to.
Oh, East Third Street, yeah. Uh, what their role was in and an effect on this movement yeah. in the urban renewal at, district at, quite at a bit. At this point, that is beyond the scope of my research. Thinking local, <laughs> so local. <laughs> Thank you. I, I have a question. You kind of took us through uh, Cheryl Edmonds' history to maybe the mid late seventies, the picture of her with Ed Koch. You mentioned her son, who was a graffiti artist. Is there, are there further chapters of her life that you didn't go into? Like, what what happened next? Um, well, she worked at UHAP until probably um, the early nineteen eighties. But at a certain point, that sweat equity program that she was really in charge of ended for a number of reasons mostly economic. And so then there wasn't really a place for her. She moved to Arizona and she passed away in 2004. Thank you for a fabulous program. I, I'm, I'm still digesting the fact that this is more than 50 years ago that this happened. Um, is there any follow-up um, or any of the people who are involved in uh, Operation Move-In still with us? What happened to Cheryl Edmonds, is she still with us? How, yeah. how about that uh, fellow who was hopping on, on the roofs? Bill, Billy Evans, I think was his name? Mark, yeah. Both Mark and Cheryl, sadly, passed away. Mark passed away in 1994 under mysterious circumstances. And Cheryl passed away in 2004. They were both living out west. They had both left the city. But Jorge, my brother-in-law, and all of the people that I mentioned in this talk that I did interviews with are still with us. And I'm hoping to connect with a lot more people and maybe people are watching and they want to connect with me and tell me their stories <laughs> about this particular period. If uh, all this research and an absolutely wonderful presentation. Thank you, Thank you so much. Um, so I studied um, urban renewal, but I studied it more on, I guess, the Bronx side. So the people who moved from Manhattan to the Bronx. And I saw, I know you mentioned the Young Lords, uh, like, I think once. Um, and I saw a kind of like the correlation between like the move in and also it made me think of the Young Lords, uh, Lincoln Center, not Lincoln Center, Lincoln Hospital, like takeover. Um, do you know if Cheryl had any, I guess, correlation or connections with the Young Lords, if it was like big or small? Um, I don't know if she had um, correlation with the Young Lords. You know, they were, do she was really, she wasn't really being political per se. She was really doing construction. Like once they started doing UHAB, she was getting people buildings. And Jorge, shared with me that they were getting buildings all over the place. They were working with people in Brooklyn. They were working with people on the East side. They were working with people on the Lower East side. They were working with people on the Bronx. And in some of those projects, they were really facilitating the, the, the getting and then the rehab of the buildings. But in other settings, they were just being asked to be like consultants, right? Like he shared with me a story about a big project in the Bronx called Banana Kelly. And, and, the, and they didn't do the work at Banana Kelly, but they were consulted about how to do aspects of the work at Banana Kelly. So, I mean, I think it was at that time, it was a small world and, and there were a lot of groups and there were a lot of people that were doing this, right? I mean, I think that what I was, what I hope I conveyed was how many layers 
this story is. And it's a, it was really difficult to put a presentation together <laughs> that made sense because there are so many different layers and there are so many different groups and there are so many different important milestones happening simultaneously because the housing issues at that time were pervasive and weren't isolated to one community. It was all over New York. So I think that Cheryl, as Jorge so beautifully said at the end of that last quote, she did whatever she could to help people who wanted to renovate a building. Thank you. Hi, my name is Ana Hualbe. I live in Amsterdam, one of the HDFCs there. And uh, I was working at Columbia University in 69, 70. And I was part-time student, but more than anything, I was just, I was a worker. And there were there was all this student activism about um, on campus about uh, you know different things that having to do with the university in housing and um, so there was a group of Latin American uh, there was a group the Latin American Studies Association and and a few of those uh, those uh, members of, of that organization helped to bring some of the the people who squatted on 111th Street and 112th Street. And I know because I got involved, you know, doing some translation or just hanging out with, with the people there. And uh, a, there was this organization, El Comité, who was uh, Rose Musia was part of, and um, this, this was a movement. It was a movement, and so there were yes organizers from the Young Lords, from the Comité, Latin Union. Uh, Joaquin here was involved in housing, and he still lives on 105th Street. And 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 it's uh, uh, it was squatters, but it was also people who didn't give up their buildings. Um, so it's it was a, a movement, as you were saying, and there are people like uh, Cheryl Edmonds and, and uh, the Latin American um, community, the Chilenos, you know, Lombo, your, your husband and his brother. Uh, we still have some of those people living uh, in the HDFCs there. And, and you know, it's it's... You know, it's amazing how how these some of these buildings are still here. The their original people, squatters on 111th Street and 1046 Amsterdam Avenue, you know. And I remember, you know, visiting friends there, making friends. It was an amazing time. And there's still amazing times. We, there's a lot of work to be done because housing is still, you know, the, the mainstay, you know, people need housing. And who can afford 4000 3000 for two bedrooms, you know, if you're lucky. Yeah. So yeah, anyway, I thank you for the yeah. uh, presentation yeah. you yeah. did. Yeah, absolutely. Right. I mean, like, if you don't have a house, what do you, what can you do? You can't do anything for your community. You and can't do anything for yourself. People's lives changed because they they squatted and they took over these buildings. Uh, you know, there's some good things and some bad things, but people were able to raise their families. Some moved out, but some people are still living there. And and, and the next generation is living there. And the next gen by now there are about three generations at 1046 Amsterdam, and, and they were and those buildings, uh, the students at Columbia, a they walked them over one night, you know, and they were mostly Dominicans. So it was uh, those buildings there were, were you know, were God sent for those, for those families. Yeah. yeah, thank you, Anna. Thank you for sharing that. want to ask um so the completed project is it going to be something like where you publish you publish it and it's available to the public like the completed 
Oh, Did you do yeah. it in like a dissertation, right? Yeah, who knows? <laughs> Is it, don't don't people usually help? <laughs> that I mean, yeah, I didn't. I, yeah. dissertation but yeah. isn't that something that where people publish um that and like because this is like you know really wonderful um research that you've done i know it's you know, you know it's you're also part of your story as well as um you know you know relative employment um it, it's just really it's, it's it's a beautiful story and it really you know shows the, the, the small heroes um you know and the of the squatting movement in New York City, you know, and like the squatting movement has gotten some bad press because in some areas, like you know, crazy white pumps have taken over, and I can't stand those stories. I actually find that the media loves those stories, and I'm always so ashamed when I read those stories. So I, I would just love to see stories like this, you know, you know, more public and just giving credit where credit is really due. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank so you. thank you for doing it. Thank you. Thank you. I think it I think it's really important to remember that whatever it is that what we're talking about here in in this particular case and in so many of the cases of the buildings that turned into HDFCs was families. Right? Families with kids. And I think that makes all the difference, right? And and you know, what what does anybody want for their family? They just want safety, stability, and security to be able to raise healthy kids and to have the energy to exist, <laughs> right? To take care of yourself, right? I mean, I think that's why that quote about autonomy to me is so powerful, that Turner quote that I put up, right? Because we don't have we don't have control over so much in our lives, right? I mean, I think that's also the thing that I got from doing this research that there's so many layers in especially when we live in a city like New York. There's so little control really over what we can do. I mean, you can pick your job. If you have money, you have more resources to pick more things. But if you're not a wealthy person, you have less and less and less autonomy. And, and I think what I found so inspiring in this story is how this, these projects, right? The movement, the squatters movement, and then later the sweat equity, and then later the till program, how they gave people who didn't have money, who many who, who were immigrants, most of whom who were black and brown, power to do something for themselves and their families. It's a very unusual thing, especially in a place like this. I think it's a fascinating story. So thank you for letting me tell it and share it. research develops. This is a preliminary one. It's one of the, it's the first, um, and that's a possibility. The other thing that should be known is that we have a wealth of people in the neighborhood who have lived here for over 40 years in buildings like what Jennifer was um, mentioning, and they're from all over the world. And it's one of the things that makes our community strong. Um, and I'm hoping we did a program on homesteading or on sweat equity buildings back about, what do you think, 15 years ago, Jim? Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, 
on to each other. Thank you, Michael.